Charles. People may not realize that's the creepy, weird song from Silence of the Lambs. Hello. Nice to see you there, Jason. Yeah, I think the title of it is Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill's theme song or whatever. Buffalo Bill bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty weird, but today, you know, we're featuring Buffalo Bill Clinton. Uh, and we're talking about the silence of the fraudsters, Charles. Yeah, I think, you know, we've been at this now. It's interesting. I guess this is our 65th uh, video that we've done. Jubilee. Yeah, and uh, exactly, 65th Jubilee. And a lot of this information has, I feel, indeed gone to prosecutors and investigators uh, inside and outside the U.S. How do you know that? Well, I just, that's just my educated guess, Jason. Huh. Uh, and uh, I think what's happening is that uh, when you play the political contest, when you're running against politicians who just go around the world spouting happy, I, keep, I hate using expletives, but I'll do it, happy horseshit, <laughs> and uh, you know, the voters, yeah, they don't care, you know, or they didn't until recently care, politicians uh -huh. sort of get inured to this process that they can say anything, promise anything, right. no one will ever hold them to account. People basically know that, don't they? That's well, that's, that's the case. See, I, 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 when I got into this now almost three years ago mm -hmm. uh, to the day, when I, when I got actively into this, and uh, one of the reasons I decided to devote so much energy and resource to it is that uh, I realized this is different than a standard investigation in the sense that it, when you're going after a politician for crimes or politicians for misdeeds, generally they don't have to write agreements you know, and, and, and annual reports and circulate them to the public of what they truly did do and get those reports of their financial statements, get them actually audited. They don't have to do any of that. But with a charity, you sort of have to do that. You, I mean, you really have to do that. Right. And so when I realized that on the one hand, the Clintons made the mistake of setting up a personal family foundation, the Clinton Family Foundation, I think in early December 2001, but then something similar, this Bill Hillary and Chelsea Clinton Foundation, October 23rd, 1997, when I realized they had all these, these filings that you could go down and trot out in the public domain, I realized that they were in one large amount of odour. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Well, I, James Comey apparently didn't realize any of this. I think James Comey is walking around in a, I don't know what, what the appropriate opioid drug is that he's on, <laughs> but I mean, he's... he's, in, he's there's something in the air up at six foot eight level that uh, is not oh, good. Oh, believe me, I know that. You know, I was disappointed that we didn't get to see him yesterday, Charles. We went over there to the, uh, to the Thomson Reuters building, but no Comey. Well, and that was a great experience. It was fun to meet those uh, high uh, citizens, that, I mean, literally high citizens <laughs> <laughs> that we met on the street Well, there. one of them was my friend Dave from college. That was weird. I, you know, in retrospect, I would have liked to get him on the broadcast and just person on the street who I randomly ran into and say, how do you know me and whatever, right. but then people would have accused me of setting that up. Right, uh, but it was, if I was referring to the guy who claimed he was conservative, the guy Robert. who was talking about socialism. I don't know why he wanted to engage us in a debate there in the middle of the street, but whatever. And we saw Superman there? Batman. Batman, Batman. Yes. okay, they're Christ. all the same. Right. Batman, <laughs> Superman. So Charles, unfortunately we're on a little bit of a time crunch today. I've okay. been doing a bunch of different shows here. We had uh, David Hawkins earlier, of course, talking about the Novichok gas and the versus BZ gas. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with that. Should we dive right into sure. the slides? Sure, we could get, let's, we're going to try to get this done in an hour. Great. Uh, and uh, to the crowd, this is one we're doing slightly differently to try to lay out, and I'm a layman, I'm not a, a lawyer, although I have discussed this with lawyers, uh, what could be the core elements in a winning criminal prosecution, not just against wild Buffalo Bill Clinton, but anyone who at this late date decides they want to go on the good ship Titanic with Bill Clinton. Uh, so the first important thing to realize here, when you think about the Clinton Foundation case, is that this isn't like a movie or, or a podcast where you can make up names and have characters and this. When you're fundraising mm -hmm. for a charity, it better actually be a charity, and it better be organized and operated lawfully in every legal jurisdiction where it intends to solicit and operate to execute the purposes for which 
the nonprofit corporation was established. Right. And so it really does matter what the, the starting place is, what's in a name? You know, what was the actual name of this Clinton Foundation? Well, it turns out we have documentary evidence obtained from the Arkansas Secretary of State mm -hmm. uh, that says and proves and confirms for the, you doubters who are out there that the name of this thing was the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation with the important word the in it. Okay. Well, and it's important, you're not joking, because that's the corporate name. Right, and so the trick here that fraudsters will do, and the FBI warns about this, is if you take a name like this, which sounds wonderful, right, into the uninitiated, if you've got a, a, a crooked bank manager who's happy to get involved in a, in a fraud because the crooked bank manager then realizes that the crooked ba bank manager gets a, a slice of the, of the incoming uh, money that would go into the bank account, Right. If that crooked bank manager is willing to open up a bank account in a slightly different name, mm -hmm. say, uh, not using the word the, and just William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. It'll sneak by a lot of people. A lot of people. And then if you, and then you could actually set up things like William Jefferson Clinton Presidential Foundation, or just Clinton Foundation. Um, Save that for later. It's okay. So uh, if we, Go back to Sorry. that's all right. Um, so that was its real name, and we know the precise dates from the 23rd of October 1997 to the 24th of April 2005. That was its actual name, the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. Then on the 25th of April 2005, it was changed to the William J. Clinton Foundation, taking out the word presidential. Mm. And then on June 30th, it was changed to William J. Clinton Foundation, taking out the word the. And then on the 9th of April, it was changed to Bill Hillary and Chelsea Clinton Foundation. So you take this a step further. If you're a real, you know, fraudster, grandiose, extraordinaire, Clinton yeah. style, yeah. you look at this, and, and somebody reminded me, I forget, no, no, I'm not going to remember who it was. Oh, it was Lee Stranahan who reminded us in, in that broadcast that, uh, that Bill Clinton, when he was at Georgetown, studied, on one of the world's ex studied under one of the world's experts on charity oh. fraud. Really? Yeah. So we've got to go back into that. I've got to get the name of that, that Lee mentioned there. We've got to read those books. I think it was something like Quigley. Uh, that, something. that does ring a bell. Right. And so um, to say that this, you know, Bill is many things, but he's not stupid. Mm -hmm. And to say that, you know, he wouldn't have remembered how charity frauds worked, having spent you know, <laughs> in, in, in very impressionable time period. He's gone from, you know, Nowheresville, Arkansas into Washington, D.C., you know, he's 18 years old or whatever he was, he's at Georgetown. I think the whole uh, process by which he went from Arkansas to Georgetown is, is something that historians will really have to study more closely than they have. I think Bill is a Baptist, and I'm pretty sure I know because my own grandfather on my mother's side was a Baptist minister. Baptists and Catholics don't get along very well. Huh. And so it's a little bit odd that he would have gone as a Baptist to Georgetown, which is, you know, very much was when he was there a Catholic University. Um, so that whole period and his young mind then, his young agile mind being under the, uh, you know, involved with somebody who was an expert on charity for us. Is it Carol Quigley? It is indeed, yeah. Carol yeah, Quigley. We've got an article here about right. that. So we'll have to look into that. But um, so he, here's somebody who would have understood, you know, how you can take something that sounds high, mi uh, high minded, people would believe is a, you know, upstanding institution, and then you take it out of Arkansas, its home base. And you have to register it in every state where there are laws, and that's most state law. Most states have laws regulating the solicitation of charities. Right. But you take it, and instead of registering it as the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation, you register it in New York as William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. Now you have the ability in New York to open a bank account that you may or may not tell the people back in Arkansas exists in New York. And, and this is the essence of how you would commit charity fraud. And there are, as we've talked in the past, there are accounting uh, guidelines where auditors are supposed to check these type of things. And you, know, you would look at this and you'd say, all right, has this man ever been accused of lying under oath and obstructing justice? Mm, yeah, yeah, that kind of <laughs> happens a lot to this guy. You know? Has he ever been involved in fundraising appeals that you know, may or may not have been accounted for properly, like every campaign he ran on, the ones he won and the, uh, the few that he lost. 
<clears throat> has he ever been involved with other fundraising appeals where money has gone missing? Yes, he has. So we have all these, and is he even technically an officer or director of the entity? Well, actually, no, he isn't. So why are his expenses being reimbursed if he has no legal connection to the charity? Because crime pays, Crime Charles. does pay at the Clinton Foundation <laughs> until now. So um, what we're going to do now for people is just take you quickly through the uh, introduction and the disclaimer on page two, remind uh, or tell our new um, viewers that the way we do things is a little bit different than the fake news media. I mean, we do not just invent things out of whole cloth. We study them closely even before I got involved with this business of podcasting with you, Jason. You know, I'd, I've been working on this for uh, almost a year and a half, I think, by the time I met you. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it was even two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, a lot of work had gone into this before we st I started talking about it publicly. Mm -hmm. um, I would hasten to add that you know, the Clintons are very quick to, in media matters, is generally very quick to criticize uh, anything that they deem is not exactly right. Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I invite them to tell me where this is wrong, because that will only add to the number of criminal counts that ultimately will go, go against them, because they'll be, misleading and they'll be misleading the public while they're soliciting, while the reports stand uncorrected in the public domain. Right. while they likely are under already criminal investigation. So please, by all means, you know, add to your legal liability. So what we do here <coughs> is we, uh, we, we go into the public domain, we find information in the public domain, we have reached out in certain cases now to different government officials asking questions at state level. Uh, we have indeed reached out to certain authorities, legislative authorities and foreign government authorities through intermediaries. And this is a, you know, a regular update on Wednesdays is explaining to the crowd how we are in fact now closing in yeah. uh, on what will I think be a big victory for those people who take charities seriously and that's most people across the political spectrum. Absolutely. There's more information, uh, there are ways to reach me on my site, Jason and I each have Twitter accounts and Jason's playlist has just been updated uh, to show I think quite a few different Exactly. Before we do that, I do want people to know that they can follow you on Twitter, Charles. You're just at Charles Ortel, and your Twitter following is growing tremendously. Of course, charlesortel.com is a tremendous resource where people can learn all about you. Yesterday, we went and waited for Mr. Comey, so if people want to go to the playlist, they can see that. They can view all the different videos that we've done, and I've updated it. This playlist is actually more important than ever, Charles, because as we've discussed on several previous podcasts, Crowdsource the Truth has been under attack, in part, I believe, because of the work that we've done with you. And I come to that conclusion based on what we've seen in the form of a thumbs-down attack. We've seen videos with 14,000 viewers getting 1,100 thumbs down, right. which is a real stark contrast to the overall body of videos, which are between five and 25 or 30,000 views, and usually about 95% positive reactions. So to have those outliers where we have one with one in 14 viewers disliking the video doesn't seem so likely. We also had occasion where I interviewed a blockchain witness for the blockchain-driven cryptocurrency-backed social media network known as Steemit.com, and that blockchain witness told me that he didn't like 57,000 viewers hearing negative information about Steemit.com. Now, that's not to say that Steemit had anything to do with submitting anonymous strikes to the Crowdsource the Truth channel that disabled my ability to upload videos to it, but it is a coincidental time frame in which those things happen. So of course, we've created Crowdsource the Truth 2, where new videos are streaming, but to avoid confusion, people can go to the original Crowdsource the Truth channel, where they will find the Sunday with Charles playlist, and on there we've got all the videos organized into a very convenient format, where they're all in one place, so people don't have to go back and forth looking for all these different videos. There's quite a few of them. 
Great. Well, so we can go back to the slides because I know you're pressed for yeah. time. Um, if we go to the next one, uh, all right. There's, um, we've had enough time. I mean, I read the Horowitz report when, immediately when it came out. I've gone back over it. What it confirms for me and I, uh, is that, well, it confirms for everybody, there was a freaking Clinton Foundation investigation in 2016. You know, there are all these nimrods across the web. I use that word advisedly. Uh, out there say, oh, no, there's not. Yeah, yeah, how do you know there's a Clinton Foundation? You know, there was a freaking Clinton Foundation investigation. Horowitz's report confirms it. That Many happened. people knew about it. That actually did happen. I didn't. Re did, was that in Hillary Clinton's book? I don't know. No that would have been knows. a great chapter to have a whole chapter yeah. on the Inspector yeah. General report you know, and say this happened. Yeah, and those Amazon reviews. It's like Chelsea. I told you to write another glowing, you know, review of my book. Yes, Mom. Okay, I'll do that. Charles, how are the Amazon reviews of Michael Horowitz's Inspector General report? There wouldn't be any of them, but uh, this is this the, to, for me. What this report shows is that when somebody like Horowitz with his massive team wants to go over ground. Remember, he doesn't have the purview to, inter to chase, I believe, people who exited the Justice Department. He doesn't have, he's not a prosecutor. He's just, he's, you know, he's an investigator. Uh, but when we, we see here the degree to which he went over and over and over and talks constantly about the CF investigation, which is the Clinton Foundation investigation, there was a Clinton Foundation investigation. Horowitz report confirms it. And therefore, the real questions are not, as we've said all along, the fraud. That's, that's inarguable. Mm -hmm. This is an ongoing fraud. Mm -hmm. um, the real questions are, what does the timeline look, oh, starting with the decision to let this idiot, dopey James <laughs> Comey, uh, you know, get involved with a Whitewater investigation to cover that off, cover the Vince, I, we just looked through the book quickly. He was, you see, CF investigation. That doesn't sam, sam stand for cow fertilizer investigation. It stands for Clinton Foundation investigation. Hmm. And um, in the case of, of Comey, um, you know, we know that there was an investigation that he was involved with of the Clinton Foundation starting, actually it started in February of 2001, but we know that he get, got involved with it by January of 2002. Hmm. Um, so, uh, this, this revelation in the OIG report is fantastic. If we go back into the slides, I just lifted from a previous presentation. We, we took it. Thank you, Cheryl Atkinson, for your great work. This is really important. She wrote uh, that, and I think the time frame here is August of 2016, the, the capitalized one, multiple FBI field offices are involved in the Clinton Foundation probe, including New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Little Rock. Mm. Okay. This passage, there was a good index in her book, but it, there's nothing, you, could, you can't search on Clinton Foundation and get to this. Why is that? I, I don't know, maybe people- In Cheryl's uh, book? In Cheryl's book, it's just very odd. But anyway, there it is, it's lifted from there. Um, and and the, the shocking thing here, yeah, here's her book. It's a great book. Um, I read it carefully, I look forward to her next book, and mm. I look forward to actually interviewing her at some point. She's fantastic. <clears throat> yeah. but. Um, this, this points out here that um, the, the uh, New York Times leadership, the current leadership of the New York Times, knew about these investigations. And look at the double standard <coughs> across the front page of the New York Times. How many times leading up to the election, <coughs> excuse me, did the New York Times have stories about Trump it, University, et cetera? Yeah, nothing about the Clinton grifters. Stormy and, Daniels. Well, that was, that's recently, but yeah. I'm saying back then, Nothing about the Clinton Grifter Initiative, mm. I mean, a, a global initiative. Nothing about the fact that that thing never existed legally, mm -hmm. lawfully. Nothing about the fact that the Clinton Grifter Initiative University is still in existence, and you know, in theory, a notional existence, but that's never been registered in the state of New York. And so, when I look at this, this tells me, all right, we've got Horowitz has been looking at this mess now for almost I don't know how long, a year and a half. <clears throat> He's got lots of people behind him. There's supposedly 1.2 million pages of documents or whatever that he's got. Some, many may not. 500 work. lawyers. 500 lawyers in his whole operation. I don't know how many are devoted to this. This tells me, okay, if you're serious, if the government is serious, if we actually, you know, that's six trillion that we spend on government at all levels, if the guys are actually 
and the ladies are not busy watching porn. Texting their girlfriends. Texting their girlfriend. And I heard an interesting thing from a source today that after um, Paige separated, shall we say, charitably from her, uh, her husband, husband. Yeah. guess where she lived? At Peter Strzok's house? No. I don't know. It's even weirder. McCabe's house. This that is what somebody is just told me. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but I don't but, know if it's true. Wow. But I mean, uh, and again, I don't know that that's true, but um, when, we, when we see here that now finally Horowitz, after doing all this work, is saying, indeed, there was a Clinton Foundation investigation in 2016. Then we look at the case of Corinne Brown. You know, much smaller ch uh, charity fraud, $800,000. Yeah. She's doing federal time. Yeah. Five years. Mm -hmm. Then we look at Steve. We talked about Steve Stockman, a Republican congressman, Corinne Brown being a Democrat. He just was convicted of 23 felony counts for 1.2, 1.3 million in charity fraud. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to show you now the scale of this fraud. All right? And we're going to move element by element into, again, I'm not a lawyer, but you can go to the next page. All right, yeah, we're going to go now and spend a little bit of time on these numbers. Now, rest easy, those of you who don't like numbers, because I'm making it simple for you. If you see a red thing on this, that isn't good. One red thing is really bad. Yeah. Do you see many non-red numbers up there? Forget the titles. No, it's all red. It's pretty much all red, right? And I, don't even, and I also don't like that lawyer, Gloria All Red. But <laughs> what this is, I'm going to take you through patiently, patiently. These are the names that were used. William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. Oh, yeah. All right. Instead of the William J. Clinton president. Yeah. So, right. So all of these periods in here through 2004, they used the incorrect name on their tax return. Oh. Okay. And in multiple filings in virtually every state where they attempted to register, they That's used odd. a post office box 1104, which they likely got illegally in a zip code 72203, but attached to the wrong name. There was no such entity. And we're going to show you in a second the specific laws that apply to the use of a fictitious name and the males and what kind of jail time you get if there's a you know, serious prosecutor looking at a long-standing pattern and practice of using the males deceptively to obtain things of value like speaking fees and being the co-chancellor of laureate and you know, reimbursement for travel expenses and presidential level that you shouldn't have gotten at the chair, that kind of stuff. You go away, each count of that, if it's connection with disaster relief, charity fraud, a single count's 30 years in jail. Wow. Okay. Just so, for using a fake name. Well, no, for this one thing I'll show you. It's fraud, okay. it's, the chapter of the code, I believe, is, is one of my favorite titles, Frauds and Swindles. <laughs> that, could, that could actually be like for our celebrity Jeopardy. Yeah. Frauds and swindles for a hundred. You're right. You know, it's going to be frauds and swindles for a lot more than a hundred. <laughs> so we go. Let's go row wise. In '97, it's red because they didn't file a tax return for that year. Okay. So there's the address. We know the address they used uh, from their application for federal tax exemption, which is chock a block full of lies and omits material facts. They declare no revenues in 1997. I think they did have revenues in 97. I think they milked the second presidential inaugural committee, which was a slush fund under the control of Terry McAuliffe. Well, a lot of Chinese money going into that as well. Well, there's not a lot actually any in that. It's all supposed to be American, but, but in theory. But didn't they, that was Chinagate, wasn't it? Funding his the, second well, presidential. Yeah, that's funding the campaign. This is oh. the inaugural. There's oh, a special oh, oh, for each, oh, oh, like, you know, the first inaugural oh, and the second inaugural, there's a special provision of the law that allows you to raise money for that, but then there's a special set of conditions on that money that a report then had to be filed within 90 days after the inauguration. In 93, that report is missing. I've asked for it. They won't give it to me. And the person in charge, I think, of overviewing that report in that year was Lois Lerner. Well, I could imagine that some of the laws surrounding the financing would indicate that you're not allowed to then sell ballistic missile technology to the Chinese after Pro that. Probably shouldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. So there's no declaration of any government grants. Therefore, we don't know the percentage that government grants are to the total. There's no spending on telephone declared, none on postage, none on fundraising. And there's, of course, no audit. Okay, so you start off in 1997. I'm going to run my presidential foundation. And the way I'd like to do it is by eating one hand grenade with a pin out per day. Because, I mean, that's what you've done by failing to organize the thing lawfully, 
failing to operate it lawfully. This back in 97 when the magic, the black magic is operating against you with the Lewinsky scandal and all that kind of stuff. You got bills you can't pay to Williams and Connolly. They're getting antsy. That's the law firm. They're getting antsy. How, do we, how are we going to pay for all this bill? You know, what better vehicle than a leaky slush fund foundation? Mm. So not enough en energy has yet gone into the question of from October 23, 1997 to December 31, 1997, what happened? We don't know yet. 98 and 2000 and 2002 and 2004 and 2006 and 2008 are in red. Why do you think? Bad. Also because bad and because those are election years. Ah. So if you're sitting there and you've got uh, the internet bubbling up uh -huh. and yeah. you have a new way of raising money that is nobody's really going to understand all that well hmm. and new arguments of how you may have raised money, what better way to marry up your partisan political activities, your need to finance a very expensive, ultimately, campaign in 2000 for Hillary Clinton yeah. as senator in a, in, a, in a place where the media buy is expensive, where advertising rates are very high, where salaries for political consultants are high. What better way than scamming money for that effort than to have this presidential foundation that your donors can you know, take a, ta a tax deduction for giving money to it they are happy to be on your good side. They think that you know, Al Bohr or somebody like him is going to be the president from 2001 afterwards and that the IRS will be locked up nice and tight. Literally. So, li literally. <laughs> so they're very happy to, uh, to put money in this presidential foundation and it's chump change, you know, $3,050,000. Now, this year is a joke. Now, don't be James Comey. You should be ashamed of yourself. In this entire year of 1998, what happened? In 1998, um, you know, Monica Lewinsky matter exploded in late January 1998. He was Mo also bombing caves in Afghanistan. That was more like in August. Oh. I I'm saying in the very beginning, you know, they were, they, Hillary, Hillary Clinton's reaction to all this, it's in multiple books, was not, you know, oh, I'm going to turf Bill out of the house. No, no, no. We're going to use these accusations as a, as a way to get sympathy and more votes and use it as an electoral uh, legislative advantage in the 1998 midterm elections, which is what they did. So they needed to raise money. And they, ra they, they put their trusted advisor, David Pryor, who's getting on in years now, they made him chairman of the Presidential Legal Expense Trust and a director, one of three directors of the Clinton Foundation. And he's out there furiously raising money. You know, uh, at the same time, this thing, manages to claim that in all of 1998, in all 365 days of the year, they, they managed to raise three contributions. That's it. Just three. No small contributions. Nothing came in, 20, 25 bucks. Nope. Only three large contributions. And the biggest one was for 2.3 million. And I think that's the one from the Presidential Legal Expense Trust. We've been over this in the past. That presidential legal expense, I mean, not, not from the presidential legal expense, the inauguration committee party, that thing had to have its accounts fully dealt with as of April 1997. There should have been nothing left in it. Okay. So how was there no report on it? April, should have been um, April 30th, or ish, April 30th, 97. No report on it in 97, but... By 98, it gives 2.3 million, my estimate, to the Clinton Foundation. It's the largest single gift. And uh, Vernon Jordan's wife is on the, is co-chairman of that thing. And Terry McAuliffe, huh. I think, was co-chairman of it. And they should have, they had to disclose in multiple states if you had a relationship between, like that, with overlapping donors to the Presidential Legal Expense Trust, overlapping donors to the second inaugural committee. They did none of that. I mean, of course, this is all the usual suspects. We've already used that movie and that image, but they're all still involved, still covering crimes from 20 years ago. Right. And so then you look at this and you say, all right, in 97 and 98, I buy the idea, or 98, that if I only raised three donations, okay, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't need a telephone. You know, I could be sitting there and I go, hey, Yell Jason. out the window. Yeah, yeah, Jason, give me some money. Right. And then, you know, stamps... You know, 17 bucks. I don't know why you needed to spend 17. Maybe they send the, you know, the thank you letters by 
the equivalent of certified mail or something. Well, it's the Rocky Balboa method. Remember in the first movie, he didn't have a phone. He just used to yell out the window, hey, Paulie, I'll call you later. <laughs> That's right. Well, so, 98, you know, he's living in the White House. Okay, maybe I buy the notion that there's no phone bill for the foundation and there's no employees for the foundation and there's no $17 of postage. But, you know, that's possible, right? But I don't buy the idea that there were only three donations in that, that charged period. I don't buy it at all. You go into 99, again, every time I have this in red, they're using the wrong name. It's not a real legal name. In um, 99, they magically, they, they, they claim in 98, 99, and 2000 that they didn't register in any state, right? Yeah. We contacted as many states as we could, and we have documentary evidence, listening prosecutors, we have documentary evidence that they made false and materially misleading uh, registrations in multiple states, including in New York and California in 1998, many, many other places, and we have those forms. And it shows their lies. And these forms were sent using the mail across state lines. For 17 bucks. Yeah, in 90, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah could you give me one? It's a good deal at least. Maybe postage was low back then. Hey yeah. Hillary, you got any forever, stamps? Forever stamps. Yeah, got any How stamps. long are you going to jail? Forever. <laughs> <laughs> so then in 99, you know, with all these registrations in place in 98, you look at the detail, dopey James Comey, that you didn't look at, that's provided on the Clinton Foundation website of the donations for 1999, and they magically, did they get any in January? Nope. February? Nope. March? Nope. April? Nope. May? Nope. June 15th, the first donation. You're telling me that the entire period, you've, you've beaten impeachment in February. You're telling me you didn't ask a single time for anything for the Presidential Foundation and get no, you got no money Though you spent $123,000 on fundraising in 99, according to your thing, how could you spend $123,000 on fundraising and get nothing? What'd you get, you know, the same person who was, uh, you know, I don't know, was he a crack person on the FBI team that, that couldn't find the Sarnayev brothers? I mean, what, what this crazy land here. The crack person who was smoking crack. Right, and again, here you spend nothing on postage because you're very frugal. You just say, look, <laughs> the way it's going to work is you come into the Oval Office, you drop your check off. Hey, that's illegal. You can't do that. Well, you come by our mansion in, oh, we don't have that quite yet. Uh, how did they do that? How do you operate a fundraising exercise no with office. no postage? Now, yeah. remember that use of the mails for an artifice or scheme to defraud is a serious crime. So well, you might I'm sorry to interrupt, but also 1999, the notion of doing it without mail, you weren't exactly having PayPal and websites right. and people weren't looking at it that much in 1999. But they had long experience with the black bag of cash. I mean, yes. that's something that they did know how to do. Right. Right. So you don't need to put a stamp on that black bag, you just put <laughs> a brown bag or whatever it is. Anyway, so this is implausible. They spent $3,250 on phone bill to raise like 19 transact, 19 or 20 donations, not many. 2000, they, <clears throat> they stepped the pace up, but they spent, look at this, they spent $785,000 on fundraising. That's a lot. But nothing on postage. So they have, you know, one of those uh, chauffeurs or butlers dressed up, you know, in the Grey Poupon commercial going around town in a butler outfit saying, pardon me, sir, will you please contribute to my foundation and well, put it in a cup? What if they just had an event? Yeah, I mean, aren't you mailing invitations? Or uh, it's yeah, just it doesn't so, make sense. So what could have been happening? Of course, you have campaigns going on, right? So what could have been happening is you could have joint mailings, which is illegal, but you could probably be communicating with your donors from the senatorial campaign, Democratic campaign, Gore's campaign, different you know different super PAC, whatever they had back then. Mailings, but the notion that the Presidential Foundation would spend three quarters of a million dollars on fundraising, but you know, as Jackie Gleason liked to say, nothing, nothing at all <laughs> on postage is, you know, come on, you see, don't be stupid. And uh, anyway, so then they move up here to New York in 2001. Do they bother to register the 125th Street office as you know as is required under New York law? Of course not. They don't do that. But yeah, they ask yeah. the taxpayers, uh, uh, you know, because Bill needs to live large, right? 
they, they say to taxpayers, you've got to pay for our office up here. So how do you run in 2001, how, it, it, most interesting in two and three, how in the hell do you run an office, a presidential foundation, which has people in Arkansas and people in New York, and then Ira Magazine are up in Boston starting in 2002, and then people traveling around the world. How do you do that with no telephones, and in 2002 and three with no stamps? How do you spend 2.4 million on fundraising and nothing on postage? Wow. Now this is significant because on the IRS forms, it, you have to say in these years, through 2007, you have to declare how much money you spent on postage. And the reason I suspect is extremely significant, or you better li please listen up, prosecutors. In these years, you had an opportunity, as a, as a, a change that, in time, but you had an opportunity as the, William, as the properly named the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation to apply for discounted mail. And you could, you could get a big cut down in the cost of, of the actual stamp. But to do that, you had to fill out a truthful application, which is something the Clinton Foundation people really don't like to do. Yeah. And so as a guess, they didn't want the spotlight, as it were, thinking of that film up in uh, Boston. Boston. They didn't want this, they, they thought that by saying, look, we didn't spend any money on postage. Nah, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> and then have it look as if the fundraising agent spent the money on postage. But they're caught on that because we have the legal agreements for the fundraising agents and they specifically state the fundraising, we the, you know, O'Brien, McConnell, and Pearson, the people who are disciplined in Pennsylvania uh, for illegal fundraising practices in Whoop. this time frame, Whoops. their contract says we don't pay for postage. Wow. So, you know, Mr. Comey, I saw you on uh, the clip where I have to say it was embarrassing and you really should, I hope you have a naysayer around you because you didn't listen to the naysayer. For you to say as you did when I saw, and we talked Jason ABC. Effort, on ABC, that it was an easy decision or whatever you said to shut the Clinton Foundation investigation down, I mean, you know, come on, it's an insult to morons to well, say that. No, no, that's a factual statement. It was an easy decision because if the investigation ran its full course, he would surely be incriminated. Well, and the investigations, I hope, are now <laughs> long in place here. So here we see. Look at this amount of money spent on fundraising. $1.5 million in 2001, $2.4 million in 2002, $3 million in 2003. Uh, you know, that's a lot of money on fundraising. And what do you have to do under American state laws to do fundraising? You have to register truthfully in every location and in certain cities, not hmm. just states, certain wow. cities you have to register. Where are all those registrations? Well, in a number of these federal tax forms, they say, we didn't file any. But they also say on them, but we paid for registrations. So you paid for registrations, you solicited in all these states, and you didn't file any, you know, come on guys. You only <laughs> behave like this if you believe you have our lowest learner in the IRS in a position standing on top of the question Ignore of whether this it. thing would ever be audited. And guess what? There she was, right in place in the tough decisions part of the tax exempt organization, tough special letters department or something like that. Hmm. And then by 2005, I think in January or so, she's on top of the whole shooting ball, shoot, ball of wax. So you know that as, as the Clintons, you believe you're not going to get tagged. Now, two what, what I'll explain. It, it, it stands for Old Chai. And the, te the technical name of it was Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS Initiative, Inc. Okay, this is interesting because up here, um, let's see if I get this right. Uh, I think I actually, yeah, I may have made a mistake here. Uh, 104. I think, well, anyway, this is interesting. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't make a mistake. Because they say that the address in the old Chai um, 990, they say that the address is 1200 Presidential, President Clinton Avenue in zip code 72203. But then here, from 2005, uh, 6, 7, 8, and 9, they say it's 72201. So which is it, Ira? And which is it, Clinton Foundation? And by the way, Clinton Foundation, you know, from the Secretary of State of Arkansas, we've gotten all your change of address forms, and you've never changed officially your address to 1200 oh. Presidential, President Clinton Avenue. So you see how this can be you know, an easy way to fool a lot of people, because you've got, it's not simply 
the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation at either Post Office Box 1104 or 1200 President Clinton Avenue or this place or that place. It's all over the board. There are lots of different variations. And then you layer on top of that all the different states. Yeah. You know, you could create a lot of bank accounts through which you could wash a lot of money uh, and just route it, you know, getting around all these money laundering provisions, just sending it to these different bank accounts and skiving off as much as you may want and also using it to fund political campaigns, which, you know, let's just see. Who might have had an interest in doing that? Would the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Terry McAuliffe, who was one of the three directors of the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation, starting, I believe, in 1999, right the way through for many, many years till 2013, would he have been interested in finding a way to, to raise all kinds of untraceable money to help in crucial campaigns for the Democratic National Party? I don't think so. I mean, he, he doesn't play like that. I mean, he's scrupulous. Well, I wonder if he then also might be motivated to use some of that money to pay to maybe Andrew McCabe in violation of the Hatch Act so he could give it to his wife for the state Senate campaign and then campaign for her. That would never occur to him. I How mean, could James Comey ignore that? Well, you know, he, I don't know. Maybe... It was easy to ignore. He'd get in trouble <laughs> if he did yeah. anything That's about it. It's a pretty it. nice looking house. Uh, but this OC is in red because the Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS Initiative Inc. has never provided to the public its application for federal tax exemption, nor has any part of the Clinton Foundation ever provided to the public proof that it validly obtained state tax exemption in key states like New York, in California and others, though it held out in, many, in all these states the possibility that donors could take not only a federal tax deduction, but a state tax deduction. So the old chai is a complete fiction. It's a fraud. And notice here that as we're going along, they declared no government grants, right? Until 2007, supposedly not a single government in the world had sent any money to the Clinton Foundation, not the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, not the Emirate of Kuwait. Qatar. Not Qatar, not Ireland, not Australia. Morocco. Not Unitaid and all the governments. And none of those people in through 2007 had ever done that. Because the deal with that was you say you're going to give money to the Clintons. We cash the check in some account over here. And you just don't complain too much because you really want to be defended. Or maybe you want to be taken care of in this way or that way. It's a lot cheaper to give $25 million to the Clinton Foundation Mm -hmm. you know, than to maybe do things different ways. Mm -hmm. So th the notion that dopey James Comey would, would, would you know, let this investigation wind down in 2005 as Deputy Attorney General, you know, the, the, hot, well, the guy, person who runs the Justice Department, that he would let this thing wind down uh, when we know for certain the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has taken credit for a $10 million donation in 2004 to the Clinton. We know that happened. They're a government, unless we're going to say it's, you know, it was in his personal capacity as the king, not, which I don't think he's going to want to say that since there are no income taxes in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, there's no real reason to be that charitable to the Clinton Foundation out of your personal pocket well, as the king. Uh, but couldn't he argue that he liked what they're doing? Right. Stealing money. Stealing money. That. and yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. No, I don't think so. I, I, I honestly don't think they would like that at all. So... You see here, this all adds up to $940 million raised, at, or declared, I should say, as having been raised. And look at these two years, 2008 and 2009. These are significant years because these are years, the, the, the reporting relates to 2008 and 2009. But the work putting these papers in occurred under Barack Obama's watch in 2009 and 2010, mm -hmm. right? And here we see, once Barack Obama gets in, suddenly, over half of all the contributions are from governments, but prior to that, no government gave any money. Why is that, you think? Well, this is just rubbish back here. Of course governments gave it, and they don't, the Clinton Foundation doesn't want you to know how much the governments ga gave, and these crooked government leaders, like perhaps Tony Blair, and others also don't want you to know that the money was sent toward the Clinton Foundation, but it just magically disappeared. But so why does it start showing up in 2008? Uh, pressures build. I think in part we've been over with Fabian. We know that in, in two, by 2009, remember these forms are filled out in 2009. We know that by December 2009, 
The French government is insisting and opens an investigation of Unite, the largest donor to the Clinton Foundation. Mm -hmm. So as a guess, what happened is that Barack Obama, you know, gets sworn in, the world finds out that Hillary Clinton's going to be the Secretary of State, and all these donors say, now listen, you know, we've been sending you guys a lot of money for a long time, and there's probably emails back and forth going to the Secretary of State. Maybe 33,000 of them? Well, there's probably a lot more than 33,000. Those are the ones, those are definitely <laughs> the non, bit. those are the 33,000 are the non-incriminating. Right. Those are the ones turned <laughs> over. We're talking about the ones that... Smashed and... Well, you know, which, which probably, you know, James Comey has, or, you know, the, the NSA has, or... Boeing and GE, according to Jan Weinberg. Right. So you look at this and you say, all right, 940 million over here. Now this is just through 2009, but importantly, the, the, each of these forms builds on the preceding one. So if 1997 is false, 1998, right. but this all, you can't just look at you know, the most recent year and say, that's where we, no, you gotta go all the way back. Right. Accountants never did their job. Now, this far right column, what does it say at the top, Jason? Audit. Audit. And it's a lot of no's there, Do you Charles. see, now I challenge any wise person, not wise guy, any wise person out there who wants to try to tell me that, that I'm wrong, that there's an audit. Produce the audits, send them right in to crowdsource the truth, and we will send you back directions to the appropriate accounting school because there is no audit. It's not, audit is not like you know, this presentation. You know, I like the, the, the use of the red and maybe you don't <laughs> like it. And, no, audit the rules. You've know, you got to follow the rules. You've got to be licensed in a state to be an auditor. You've got to take exams. You've got to stay up to date. And there is no legally compliant audit in this time frame of the consolidated financial results of the Clinton Foundation as is required under New York and California law, two important states where they did, in fact, fundraise throughout this entire period illegally. Now, Justin, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Charles, but how common is it for a charity to exist for 12 years and dealing with millions of dollars and never be audited? Almost a billion. How often does that happen, that there's no audit? Not too, I mean, not very, not very frequently tax-exempt things are audited more frequently than regular well, businesses? No, no, no. I, I had 21st Century 3D was audited no, by... Uh, this is slightly different. This is an audit that, not by the government, but when you set up a 501c3 of this size, you have to, you can't just, management just doesn't fill out the tax return. Right. You get, you should get best practices, one accounting firm to do the tax return, and another accounting firm is required to check management's work and produce an audit in full compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Right. Not in Slovenia, which is a nice place, I, I gather. Not in, have you been there? And not in, uh, you know, Upper Volta or whatever they call it now, Burkina Faso, but no, you actually have to get the audit done in, co in conformity with generally accepted principles in the United States of America. And, and not the, the alternative world. universe of the United States of America. <laughs> the bizarro world. <laughs> well, Hillary Clinton, where she's actually the president. No, 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 you can't do that. There's, it's one of these really cut and dried things. And you know, there's certain basic elements that you have to follow. And then as you get into this expanding and expanding around the world, you gotta check and make sure, the auditors have to check and make sure that a charity such as this is allowed to do all these different crazy ass things that the Clinton Foundation went off and did. So you look at this, I'm spending a little bit more time on this than normal, but you look at this and I hope your takeaway is that it's not gray. You know, there's it's nothing red. gray about this. This is in black and white and, and red. mostly red. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is a serious financial fraud in the initial years and it only gets worse under Barack Obama. What I want to just show if the, if the foundation of a structure is riddled with problems, then the top of it can't be better. The whole thing's going to fall down. Now, how might it fall down? Let's go to the next page. So, Charles, do you think that this is a fraud that would make Quigs, Quigley blush? I, I think it's a, the most, it's, it's the largest unprosecuted fraud ever attempted anywhere in this modern era. Now, maybe back in the ancient civilization, some are saying that existed 48 million years ago in Antarctica. Maybe, maybe they were big cavemen, stole all the mammoth wool, and yeah, whatever it was like back then, you know. But in, in the modern period, this is an epic fraud. So let's just focus on some of these key words. 18 U.S.C. 1341. I'm not a lawyer. 
The, the actual technical title of this chapter or whatever is Frauds and Swindles, which will definitely, I love that. Oh yeah, look at that. So I've, I've put this up, whoever in red, whoever um, having devised or intended to devise any scheme or artifice to defraud or for obtaining money or property by means of false or fraudulent pretense. So let's think about a false or fraudulent pretense. Simple case. Hey, Jason, give me a million dollars to fight HIV AIDS internationally. You say, okay, Charles, that's fine by me. That's a fraud. I don't have the right to fight HIV AIDS internationally. I have not taken the requisite care to amend my articles of incorporation, to expand my purposes, to go to the IRS, say, look, before I do that, can I do this? Get the okay, then I go back to you. Having you know, made sure that my registration in New York is actually also amended, I go to you and I say, you know, I'm not, I have nothing to do with this foundation, my name's on it, I'm not an officer, I'm not a director, would you please give me a million dollars to fight HIV AIDS? And then you say, no, you schmuck. Yeah. <laughs> of course I wouldn't do that. But anyway, this is a massive, this is the centerpiece of the fraud and, sin, uh, and swindle. They did not have the lawful right to approach any donor for a purpose other than being a presidential, or a repository of presidential records in Little Rod, mm. other, Little Rod. That was a little rot. slip, slip of the slip Huge of the tongue, um, or a research center based in Little Rot, or endowment out there. That's all. I, I didn't have a right to you know, have a fancy office in New York. I didn't have a right to have a, a dump of an office in Boston, or to fly in charter jets around the world, or to stay in president, or to have high living, or to you know entertain presidents of countries who knows with black bags of cash. I didn't have any of that right, but they went ahead and did that. So whoever does any of that, now look at the next thing, places in any post office or authorized depository for mail matter, any matter or thing, whatever, to be sent or delivered by the postal service. Looks like they did some of that, yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. It looks like they're records of all that, okay? And then it says, if the violation occurs in relation to or involving any benefit authorized, uh, transported, transmitted, trans deferred, dispersed, or paid in connection with a presidentially declared major disaster or emergency, such as Earthquake. Hurricane Katrina. Oh. Well, we have that most recent piece out. Oh, yeah. It's gotten a lot of attention. Thank you to Alan West for picking it up. Thank you to the Tea Party for picking it up. Hmm. We back, the intent of it is to focus on gross misdeeds of the Clinton piece of it. Right. The, the George H.W. piece, there is, I think, some culpability for that. In deference, and I know we're not going to get into it, but you know, it's, we're not going to pound George H. W. Bush today. Not we're today. going to wait till Monday. Yeah, but um, Sunday, Sunday, really. Yeah, Sunday. I'm, um, I'm showing everyone the uh, mini golf course and strip club in Arkansas right, right now, just for reference. So the penalty, if it affects a, or if it affects a financial institution, shall be fined not more than a million dollars per count, Ooh. or imprisoned not more than thirty years wow. per count, or both. It's a lot. So it seems to me like waving this over your head, you know, here we have, you know, Bob Mueller waving, you know, a hundred and twenty thousand dollar potential violation oh, of maybe an equity. To Stormy Daniels. Well, the equity line of credit, maybe a false application for a home equity line of credit, 120,000. 940 million, a long-standing pattern and practice of using the postal system for an, a scheme or artifice to defraud again and again and again. Okay, and the record is out there. You don't need to get dopey James Comey and his acolytes to try to find it. It's on the Clinton Foundation website. You know, they can't take it off their website because you can go back on the Wayback Machine. Everything right. they put on, we have already. Go to the next page. Yeah. Please. Okay, here we see 18 U.S.C. 1342, fictitious name or address. Mm. Right? Whoever, for the purpose of uh, promoting or carrying on by means of the Postal Service, you listening, Postal Service? Any scheme or device in Section 1341, we just went over that, or any other unlawful business. Now, do we think charity fraud? Might that be any other unlawful business using the mail? Yeah, pretty, <laughs> pretty much. Uses or assumes or requests to be addressed by any fictitious, false, or assumed title, name, or address, or name other than its proper name, okay? The William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. 
Nowhere is there any Clinton initiative of any kind, the small business initiative, the massage parlor initiative, the catering <laughs> service, the museum store initiative, none of that stuff. Right. right. But they went and raised a lot of money, 940 million from 98 through 2009, you repetitively using, and they never have filed a tax return uh, until I, uh, in this period, they never filed a tax return using their correct name. They never used their registered address. Massage parlor initiative wouldn't get donations. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever you call that stuff. <laughs> and, and then you get false statements. I mean, I didn't read the whole this thing because it would all be read, you know? Element three is 18 U.S.C. 1001. Now this you don't get as much of a penalty. This is only five years. This is five years or maybe. So you're saying if someone makes a false statement in an effort to make money for a 501c3, that's well, uh, five years. Well, I, again, I think the way lawyers, and I'm not a lawyer, but the way prosecutors would look at this is they would say, all right, you know, this is dead meat. You know, the question, there are how many different ways can we get them? We're starting here on federal crimes. Mm. They're state crimes, they're foreign crimes. Let's pick the federal crimes that have the harshest penalties that are the easiest to prove. The best ones. And we'll start with them. Once we convict them, yeah. you know, then they're a convicted felon. You know, and then, you know, I'm not saying it's double jeopardy necessarily, but it might be a strategy. You, you convict them on the easiest things first, one or two or three or four or five counts get them convicted, and then you go after them for the other crimes. Hmm. Might be an approach. Now, I mean, how long can you stay in hell? Well, right, if somebody's 70 and you put them in jail for 30 years, that's kind of like enough, right? No, not the way I look at it, given, given what's happening. I mean, I hear I think just you know, this impressionable lad, or cad, who was at Georgetown, you know, he studies under the, he gets his BA in charity fraud, yeah. right? And then he, he, he learns it well. He got, becomes a rogue scholar. He meets <laughs> another rogue scholar in Iron Magazine, and they say, hey, this is great, charity fraud. We can make a lot of money doing this, and we'll be you know, public servants. We'll be lionized. Mm. Um, no, I think you've got to make an example of this. So we go to the next page. That's where uh, obstruction of justice. Now, you know, that's something we know this dude knows how to do. And we know, or no, Bill. Both of them. Bill. No, Bill was, in, was indicted for obstruction of justice. It was one what of his two, he... two impeachment counts. Was the one, there were four impeachment charges, or, and, and he was indicted for lying under oath and obstruction of justice. We know he knows how to do that. But well, what was the obstruction of justice that he did? The obstruction of justice was to, to turn the, he was president of the United States and he was using his power and his connections to impede the investigation into false statements having to do with to Ken Starr and the Monaco and all that stuff. Yeah. But um, here, you know, I would argue their entire career in that politics. Has been obstructing obstructing justice. Right? Absolutely. We'll go to a state, you know, where we can walk our way in, attorney general, then governor, We'll do the main thing. Control the coroner. Everything. You have a good time, in Little Rock. And then, you know, then we'll do a deal with HW and we'll walk in to be President of the United States and we'll you know, take it to global stage. And we should not just skip over the fact that the real inflection point where the Clintons may have gained favor with the Bushes was the MENA Arkansas importation of cocaine into that airport during Iran Contra. Yeah. So um, for those who are lawyers, you probably already know this far, I hope you know this better than I do. We've provided certain links, we don't need to go up to them, uh, where you can actually read for each of these uh, different US code sections. But to, as, we were, as I was doing this, Ron DeSantis filed a uh, criminal referral. Uh, and this is worth pulling up, this, if you can yeah. get to it. Uh, oh, on Zero Hedge here? Yeah, yeah. Right, and there was also some reporting on that in True Pundit that, uh, or sorry, I don't know if that was, the, yeah, that was, was the same thing. But you know, this is interesting. This went up at uh, 150, it has 2,800 shares. So I guess people are thinking hashtag lock them up. Yeah, and, and, and it's high time. You know, the, this crew got together and they really thought, you know what we're gonna do? It's so much easier to cheat. You know, well, these elections, you know, let them do this, let them do that crap. You know, Hillary's gonna be the president, you know? and. 
So we have all this dirt on the Clintons. We can, we can control the Clintons if she gets elected. We want her to be elected. So let's let somebody who's under FBI investigation starting July 10th, 2015, <laughs> let's let her be the nominee. Because Dopey James Comey's head of the FBI. He's not going to let anything happen. Let's put the American public through a charade. And I think, you know, the, none of these alias, you see that you can't use false names in business, really, to transact business. But here we have Loretta Lynch used a false name. Hillary Clinton used my, multiple false names. Oh, you mean on the emails? On the emails. You're not supposed to do that. And actually, uh, it just guts the whole Freedom of Information Act approach. If, you can, if Jason Guggen can have, you know, when, he's, when, he, when, as and if, which I know you wouldn't do, you're conducting fraud, you use, you know, Able Danger as your code name oh. or something like that. Um, that, that's what these people were doing. Hmm. And the full extent of this needs to be exposed, and they need to pay, I'm not suggesting the death penalty, but they need to pay very serious penalties here so that the future generations, the people who would engage in this activity, learn a hard lesson that the Clinton way is not the American way. Right. And we meet, need to make an example. Every single one of these people, the weakest links in here, Loretta Lynch is the poorest person on this page. Financially poor. Finan financially poor. Yeah, financially poorest person on this page. Least wealthy. Poorest. Yeah. yeah whatever. She doesn't have much scratch. I'm sure she's doing all right. Uh, I just want to reiterate that Able Danger has not done fraud, and neither have I. That was just a. Yeah, yeah. We're off I'm the, just off the, off the dome. I'm riffing. I'm yeah. riffing. So, you know, these people need to be brought to account, and, and the people who enabled them, and the people who, you know, especially McCabe, especially Comey, and there's a long list here. Uh, They're all making a similar face. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny how it's that the happens. the oops, I did it again face. Yeah, and, and you know, Ron DeSantis is running for governor, I believe, in Florida. He's a, he's a smart man, a principal person. Um, it's time for other people. It's time for a Democrat to stand up. And there's got to be one Democrat in the United States of America who can look at this and say, you know what? I'm not down with this anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm really not. Um, yeah, this is True Pundit, Thomas Paine. Yep. Um, so people will question you, Charles, and say, why is Thomas Paine of True Pundit able to be Thomas Paine? Well, again, I'm not really, I don't know his own particular, although I, you know, I believe I may know who he is. I don't know why he might not want to use his real name, but I would strongly encourage people to use their real names. I think you know, it bolsters the case to stand up now that we have uh, made a lot of progress here. It would seem that there, you know, the evidence is out there in the case of the Clinton Foundation fraud. It has to be out there. Um, it seems like prosecutors are getting motivated to do the right thing. It seems like the president is doing the right thing here. And it seems like, you know, there's a, a, the American public will generally be much better off fully exposing this, fully explaining, you know, why the Harvards and the Yales and the endowed universities enabled this fraud, put their stamps of approval on this fraud. Why is it so damn expensive to go to Harvard and Yale and Princeton when they have these massive endowments? Why are these professors making all this money enabling and blessing these frauds? Why are they teaching all this garbage at these expensive schools and we find these kids coming out of school can barely tie their shoes. They walk around with these social justice warrior outfits on with these stupid caps and scruffy beards and spout gibberish. Did you know that Bernadine Dorn teaches a class at Northwestern University sure. about torture methods and practices? I'm sure she's a distinguished professor. You this know, also looks like Hillary's about to ask you if you want fries with that, Charles. So perhaps <laughs> she does have yeah, a, I would, I would another career I in I definitely works. wouldn't want to eat any of them. <laughs> So um, then you go, uh, we don't need to pull this up again. We sh there's a link for those of you who have not seen it before, this William uh, J. Clinton Foundation investigation, which did happen. This is the one where Dopey James Comey looked at this and said, eh, nothing. Yeah. I mean, this is the time frame. We got a foundation with the wrong address, wrong name, spent magically raising money, using an illegal fundraiser, not registering in any state, not it's declaring its delicious. international activities. None of that's, yeah, it's just, that's okay. Yeah. I'll let that go. No sensible prosecutor right. would get involved yeah. with that. And then, you know, we have this issue on uh, the Cohen law firm. Michael Cohen, this president here. Um, I think we need to stand back and ask some very important questions. There are quite a few firms representing themselves as being law firms. Baker Hostetler, Mintz Levin, Williams and Connolly. Uh, uh, what's the firm uh, that... Uh, Perkin Coey? Perkins, well, not in the Clinton Foundation, the, the one, uh, Simpson Thatcher, uh, and the one that uh, Comey's brother works for. 
oh, Purple Lovell or something. Well, that's Hogan, uh, Hogan, Hogan Lovell, Lovell, but no, that, that was, a different. anyway, there's another one. Um, if it is fair to go after Michael Cohen and saying, hey, I, on this deal, you weren't a lawyer, you don't have any attorney-client privilege in the Michael oh. Cohen case. Why isn't it fair then to go after Williams and Connolly and say, actually, you weren't law firm. You were raising book deals, arranging book deals for Bill and for Hillary. You were arranging speaking engagements, maybe. You got this foundation up and running. You were doing all this to get your legal bills paid because the Clintons had run up, by their own admission, more than $10 million of debt they couldn't pay. And Bill was only making $200,000 a year, and Hillary was set to go in and be a senator. So, you know, if you're going to go after Michael Cohen, Kimba Wood, the way you do, and demand that they tell us all of their clients, why shouldn't the same approach be taken against Williams and Connolly and maybe Simpson Thatcher that issued a ridiculous report on the mm. Clinton Foundation that has covered up, I would argue, this fraud and enabled this fraud? Why isn't that standard applicable in this case as well? I think the correct answer is it shouldn't have been used in either case. You know, you go down this thing of saying, well, you're not really a lawyer. <laughs> right, yeah. But now they're saying that the judge was a playboy bunny and that she had an extramarital affair. I don't know that those things are really relevant to her well, ability but, to be a judge, but this whole not believing in attorney-client privilege, that's not good. I think as long well as being in playboy is legal and having an extramarital affair is her own personal business, I mean, I don't know that that's really... Well, no, the big issue was that Bill Clinton, if you remember back to 93, what happened is the first um, candidate to be attorney general was put forward and then had to be withdrawn. She was the second one that Bill Clinton... This woman was yeah. the candidate for attorney general? Nominee. Wow. Bill Clinton nominated this person to be his first attorney general, and she withdrew from the process because she had not revealed that she hadn't paid... Uh, taxes on her nannies or something like that's that. That's relevant. Yeah, but, that's highly but relevant. being in Playboy, I mean, that'll get you nominated yeah. by Bill Clinton, but it shouldn't stop you from being a judge. <laughs> yeah. What does Gorka say here? Yeah, he's, she is a Clinton confidant who was chosen by Hillary to be AG. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, that's bad, too. I mean, that again, that shows cronyism and everything. Right. And it's, the Playboy it, stuff, just sort of like, why do we need that? that yeah. Stuff. And on this one, I mean, here, what we're talking about here, you know, this, I would say, people talk about this, it's Clinton, it's this. No, this is Obamagate. Mm. Okay. This is, you know, we, we, we don't just need, as, as, as DeSantis wants to look at the 15, 16 election cycle, that's not what we need to do. We need to go all, way back, maybe as far back as 1988. And understand how the deep state, maybe further back than that, yeah. how has the deep state been meddling in elections to make sure that, that the politicians of both parties will support these, these crazy projects and these black bag budgets and all that? How much has the deep state been colluding, particularly as technology got more and more powerful yes. in 99 and afterwards? Right. So, Corporate um, media, investors, the technocratic, right. you know. So why would we want to do all this? If we go to the next page, I think you have the answer. This is a very interesting statute, okay? We're not gonna, we're very close on time. Um, lawyers in the room could echo and, and talk about, there's, there's a, a large number of elements of racketeering cases. I selected only one, this uh, section 1962, but there are other sections as well. And the civil and criminal penalties, or uh, criminal penalties and civil remedies, are set out there for you to read. You are in. Let's just put it this way: so make it just the same way I did with numbers. Red is bad. Let's say black is good. Uh, racketeering is the worst kind of red. I mean, you don't want to be accused of racketeering because the penalties are extraordinary. The ability the government has. If the government were to do what I think they should do and say, you know what, this whole Clinton, Bush, Obama presidential fair charity mess is a criminal enterprise. Yeah. It has always been nothing other than a criminal. It was, you wash my back, I'll wash yours. This started way back when, um, and it could not have, have gone along as it did without many people in the IRS, in the FTC, in the Department of Justice of both political parties saying, you know what, I'm down with this because this means <laughs> I have information on the president so that when I break the law, yeah. you know, they can't come after me. Right. That's how the swamp was born. That's how the, well, maybe the swamp was born earlier, but that's how the modern swamp took that's, shape. That's the river feeding the swamp. Right, the river runs through it or the river runs deep. <laughs> Directly into it. Yeah. 
So with that, um, I think here, you know, we have many signs of, uh, in the public domain. We, we know that Cody Highland is the U.S. Attorney, I think, Eastern District of Arkansas. We know that uh, that fellow out, in, uh, what's his name, Huber in Utah. There are rumors that, uh, well, there was a public announcement that uh, back in, I think, July of 2016, we've had this up before, the IRS confirmed that it was through its Dallas office investigating the Clinton Foundation. It would be natural, you know, we do this day in and well, week in and week out. We're going to step the pace up in the print and other media forms, putting pressure on people. We encourage members of the crowd to contact their congressperson, contact their senator, contact their governor, but most importantly, contact your attorney general in your state and say, what the hell? Go and check and see if the Clinton Foundation is registered in your state. And if it is, to say, what the hell? I mean, this isn't a foundation, it's a criminal enterprise. Why are you allowing this thing to fund, raise money? And if enough people around the world, I'm now getting emails from people around the world, I can confirm that I will be, I believe, if, assuming things move as they're doing, uh, addressing the German parliament in May uh, and meeting with members there and doing a global press conference out there. Other countries are reaching out. As this begins to take shape, there will be a lot of interest. I just got something today from somebody who's connected to Norway. There are people who watch, lots and lots of people watch this despite the efforts to shut it down. They're keenly interested in seeing that this get, that the slate gets wiped clean, that the people who are dirty do the time, pay the fines they should pay, even if it means President Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton and the other people around this, even if they all have to do jail time. Most people who think about this and know anything about charities, they're down with that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Charles, that was a, a damning indictment of the Clintons and their cohorts. As, as usual, I would say, there's never a day off when it comes to uh, trying to bring the long arm of the law to grasp some of the Clinton uh, cohorts. Anything else you want to say before we wrap it up right now? No, I th thank members of the crowd and thanks for your support and thanks for your interest, your suggestions. Uh, I know Jason and I really appreciate all your suggestions and, and support and I know there are various ways to support. Yes, of course. Well, people who enjoy watching Crowdsource the Truth can become sponsors on patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth or make a one-time sponsorship payment at paypal.me slash crowdsource the truth. If you're enjoying your time phone hacking, you can get a hack to the future mug from redbubble.com and you can go on there and search for crowdsource the truth. There's a lot of good gear, great foretell, there's some stuff on there. And uh, we'll be back on Sunday with uh, some more Sunday with Charles and I'm sure additional information that the Clintons will hate. <laughs> Very good. All right, thanks Charles, thanks everybody for watching. See you soon.